everyone has a story. The automotive world is surrounded by some of the most passionate people on the planet. There's builders, collectors, and craftsmen who all have something to tell. is Stories in Steel. Welcome to Paradise. On this episode of Stories in Steel, the gang is hitching a ride down the boulevard of broken dreams as they head out on holiday. They have a visit with Chip Quinn in Phoenix, Arizona. There's no pulling teeth in this episode because we're having a blast talking to a guy who's a walking contradiction. While he may not be the Jesus of suburbia, Chip has definitely cemented his reputation as being one of the finest louver artists in the world and is a cheerleader for the hot rod community in and around the Phoenix area. You would definitely find yourself in the minority if you can't find something to like about the guy. So come along with us as we make a left at the westbound sign and dive deep into this brain stew of conversation. Hopefully it won't leave you feeling like a basket case. I, I have been wanting to come over here for a long time and, and do a little story on you. Yeah. Um, I don't know about sitting in a, in a blazing hot <laughs> shop in a balmy Phoenix afternoon. <laughs> Well, it's only 102. <laughs> well, outside, I don't know what it is in this. <laughs> Four million. <laughs> but uh, let's let's talk about you for a second. You okay. are you are the kind of the premier cheerleader of uh, of the hot rodding world of, of the Phoenix Valley. I always look at you like that. If anybody anybody wants to know what's going on, or uh, anything that's going on, they they come see you because you are uh, you are that guy. But uh, let, let's go back a little ways and. Uh, you're, you're kind of the louver guy. You do a lot of fabrication. Yes. And uh, a, lot, a lot of building, a lot of, a lot of cool old stuff. We're looking at, I got a modified sitting in front of me here right now. That's, uh, that's pretty cool that, uh, that you put together. But um, anyway, back to you here. So you started, you've been doing this a long time. A long time. I don't know. Is this, is this what you originally were doing? Is this, is this always been you or uh, well, how, how far back does this go? Yes and no. Okay. The, the long story is that I was born to this stuff. My dad had a race car shop in St. Paul, and I literally, when I was you know five-year-old kid, the school bus dropped me off at the Cleveland Road uh, chassis and, and engine assembly plant, and I hung out there in the afternoons and took naps in front-loaded fuelers that were there and bugged the guys as they were welding T-bucket chassis together and stuff like that, so it's been forever. I've had two or three four diversions off the path in different careers doing stuff out in the out in the real world right but I've always I've always done something automotive uh, on top of the 60 hours a week that I'm selling sewing machines right. or selling insurance you do that grown-up stuff which really yeah I did suck sometimes I did grown up but I suck yeah uh, I'm not a good grown-up we'll say they help finance your stuff in the garage oh, that you yeah. wanted to work on doing, most certainly. doing the adulting thing most so. certainly so so let's let's go back to the, the louver thing so sure. the louver thing you're uh you do stuff all over the country you ship things all over the world actually all over the world i've got stuff in australia i've got stuff in japan i have a roll pad for a 32-3 window in Liechtenstein. really yeah i didn't even know Liechtenstein was still a country but no offense to Liechtenstein, of course wow yeah so 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 what brought the louver thing about almost 30 years ago, I had two cars that I wanted louvered hoods on. The only person in town at the time that was louvering hoods was about 35 miles away. And he wanted, 30 years ago, $3 a hole, plus a $120 setup fee. And it might take anywhere between three and five months. So I put the, uh, I put the detective hat on and I went looking for the press that had cost me thousands in the 80s. Right. Because I knew it had been sold. And I finally found it uh, 35 miles up the road in, in Wickenburg, Arizona. The very same press. Very same press. 
Yeah, it was in it was in a shop here in Phoenix for years called Big Bill's Deals and Wheels. And when I was in my teens in the mid '80s, I built a '65 bug that had somewhere on the order of 350 louvers in it. At, at three bucks. Well, no, no, no. This was this was back when Big Bill had it. It was okay. about a dollar a hole okay. back then, okay. something like that. But I'd get my paycheck from Flint British Motors on Friday, and I'd go over to Big Bill's on Saturday, and we'd punch another fifty dollars worth of louvers, whatever I had to spend that day. Right. And uh, so anyway, I kind of made a I made a midnight run up to uh, Wickenburg and uh, bought the press. Unfortunately, the way it kind of came to me was. Uh, I, I called up there on a Sunday having the name and number of the guy that had the press. And I asked for Bob Houle, and I got a lady that went absolutely hysterical when I asked for Bob Houle and started weeping and crying and handed the phone to his son, who came over and very angrily explained to me that they had just come back from Bob's funeral. Okay, so you didn't the best timing in the world. So it wasn't now. the best timing in the world, so <laughs> here I am trying to talk to him. And uh, yeah, not sound like a complete idiot. And so the only thing I, I get to a point in our conversation where the only thing I can think of is, so are you going to continue louvering? <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> says, my dad uh, got me into this whole thing. He set me up in this business. I hate doing this business. He said, if you can get here by 7 o'clock tonight with X number of dollars, I'll sell you the whole press, I'll sell you the whole damn business. And I went, I better start digging up money right now. And I uh, went and grabbed my buddy Steve Szymanski and said, I need a truck. And his dad was out of town, so we literally went and broke into the garage, took the keys to his brand new Dakota, and uh, <laughs> took Lynn's truck up to, up to Wickenburg and put a, you know, a, a, about a three-quarter ton press into the back of the brand new Dakota and, and dragged it home. And that was the beginnings. Once it was sitting here, I figured it that, well, I probably better, I've spent a lot of money on this, probably better make me money at some point or another. And that was the beginnings of Hot Rod Central Looper Company. Wow. Uh, you had told me a story a while back, and I'm not sure if it, I, I wasn't sure if it pertained to buying this or just getting louvers done. And it was, it had to do with your electric bill and louvers. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that was back in, that was back when Big Bill had it. Uh, and I lived in Tempe. I had my first apartment down in Tempe, which is, you know, 20 miles from here, 15 miles, something like that. And uh, as I said, I was going down there once a week on Saturdays and having them punch another 40, 50 louvers, whatever I could afford that week. And so I got my, my first electricity bill on my apartment. And it was due on like the 31st. I went, well, they won't mind if it's late a week or so. And it was like 60 bucks, something like that, which you know, was pretty normal back then. And so I, Saturday comes along, I get my paycheck. It's like, I got to get more louvers done this week. I'll just get them done and I'll pay the, pay the, the electricity bill later. So I go run over to Bill's and I did $50, $50 worth of louvers. And uh, Tuesday morning I wake up and my, my electricity goes, blink, done. Sure shit, they will actually shut off your electricity <laughs> if you don't pay them on time. It's amazing how but, that but works. But you got louvers. But I got louvers see, that's out the, of That's the, the important thing. You exactly. did get louvers. And they were they were perfectly worthwhile louvers. There you they go. were louvers see, in an aluminum that, dash in my, in my cow bug. <laughs> that is a full-on dude move right there. <laughs> I, oh, oh, women would never be that irresponsible. That is us. That is a full-on <laughs> guy. <thing. laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, how long did you? How long were you without power? I was I was without power for like yet? about a week, <laughs> about a week, and it was this time of year, so it was 120 uh, in the house, and everything else was fine. But you got louvers. But I got louvers. That's the important thing. That's all. And that I, I think here. I probably spent more on louvers the next weekend too. But then, <laughs> who cares? That's the way it was. So yeah, that this press actually cost me my electricity at one time, and that's kind of why I bought it back when I had the chance to. Other than the fact I just flat needed one. Right. And you know, who wakes up on a Saturday morning and goes, I think I need a louver press. So you obviously made a business out of it. Well, yeah, that I did. You're shipping all over the world. You bought. Okay, what is what is the weirdest thing you've punched louvers in? I got one of your little key ring, little yeah. key fob ring I'm thingies that's got some. In the process of doing 500 of those for Hot Rod Around Up in Pendleton, Oregon this summer. But uh, no, the, the oddest thing. I've done a lot of really weird ball stuff that that isn't hot rod related, like uh, locker doors for a, a the uh, security kiosk at a very very high end 
uh, gated community up in up in Scottsdale area. Really? And it's I'm ch I'm driving through the gate one time to go uh, look at a customer's car up there, and I stop in at the security office up there, and the guy comes out and says, "Are you confused, sir?" I said, "No, but I punched all those louvers in those." Okay, thanks. Have a nice day. Go see your client. <laughs> I'm a crazy person, huh? <laughs> Uh, but I think the most fun is, is a buddy of mine, uh, Jeff brought over, he, he got into to vintage tractors, and he's also a hot rod. Okay. So he brought over one of the triangles, the safety triangles on the back of the tractor, and we louvered the, the uh, safety triangle for the back of the tractor. That's pretty So we, cool. we converted it into a hot rod tractor. Just, just whether, whether it be or not. <laughs> So uh, go back to uh, go back to you being your uh, your your hot rodding you know cheerleader guy. We're gonna do kind of what 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 Brian and I did uh, did yesterday. We're gonna kind of kind of jump around because it seemed to work. Cool. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. <laughs> That's right. That way I won't we're gonna, melt we're into gonna, a puddle we're gonna, of we're impossibility gonna, in the heat here. Yeah, we're gonna Tarantino this thing. as yeah. as, as Brian as Brian put it. So. Uh, this is there you go. So uh, a while back, you would kind of you would kind of help raise him from a, from a dark abyss of, of his life and and on one of your cruises. No, this is actually a good yeah, thing. I, know, I, 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 I kind of tried to get you guys together because he was having a tough time. And, yeah. and you did one of your uh, freezing cold little runs up up whatever mountain that, that South Mountain Park. And uh, which I've done up. I've been one of the runs with you, which is kind of a fun little deal to just get in your car and drive up there. But uh, you you seem to do a lot of events like that around here. You've kind of become... I do my best. So this last one you did, you had a bunch of cars. You didn't even have a car. It was even funny. You didn't have the wagon done, and you didn't have the yeah. roaster, and you didn't... <laughs> yeah, I have this. Well, that's that's a yearly thing. That's our, our thanks, Thanksgiving morning cruise up South Mountain Park. Okay. And it's been going... I actually didn't organize it. My buddy, Nikki Flores, did, and I just kind of do the cheerleading part on it, and... Uh, Kind of fill the fill the uh, the benches, if you will. So, see if you live if you live in the Phoenix area around when is it Thanksgiving? Around Thanksgiving, yeah, yeah you got to you got to look these guys up. Yeah, you absolutely have to join us for that. Because you had a pretty good group this last one. That was yeah, the biggest had, one so far. We had, I think, we were up to almost ninety cars. It was <laughs> awesome. And it's just ninety you, when, cars. When you go up this road, you didn't get all the way to the top. No, of the it road, was still washed but out. But it's just this beautiful, twisty, turny desert mountain road going up to the top of this thing and everywhere you looked there was a hot rod coming up the coming up the road but it was colder than cold and all that stuff and yeah I was without the tea bucket and I rode with my buddy Ed Grimma and his, his uh, metal flake model a coupe okay so something cool. you had something cool to cruise in. yeah so you weren't you weren't stuck in the Tahoe <laughs> yeah no 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 we weren't stuck in the Tahoe we don't <laughs> we don't do Tahoe stuff <laughs> no yeah. actually an aside on that one his trip in the tea bucket up uh, up South Mountain. Uh, not only was a ball, we had a good time that day, but your son snapped the absolute perfect picture of Phoenix hot rodding. He was riding with a friend of mine behind us in a Model A sedan, and he caught a picture of Nicky Flores and his Model A Cabriolet, and he and I in the tea bucket going through this canyon of glass buildings downtown. And it's one of the only pictures that I know of that actually has a soundtrack, even though it, it's just a static picture. And you can hear oh, the cars. Cool. I'll have to show it to you. I will have to see the photo. So what, is, uh, so what is the next plan? Obviously, you're still punching rivers. You're still going to be putting events together. You get a little donut run that you that you work on. You had a hamburger joint you were doing, but I think they closed the burger joint. <laughs> they closed that. Not only closed it, they tore it down. It's it's gone. They're like, you're done. Okay, I'm out of here. Boy, they showed you, didn't they? Yeah, they showed me. <laughs> Thanks for all your help. We're just going to rip the place just down. Just tear down. the place down. Yeah, I, I always do stuff. I mean, we've had a couple things where friends have been trying to put together, like drive-in movies on acreage that they have and things like that. And right now, with the situation that's going, we don't have anything going at all. But the Bosa run is the third Sunday of every month, and, and uh, every Every month or so, we go take a drive somewhere and go do something. So that that end is just fluid. It's it's always somebody will come up to me and say, "Hey, it would be really cool if we all went up to Yarnell this weekend. Let's do it." And I hit Facebook and 
pound in the old, hey, everybody, let's go to Yarnell this weekend with the hot rods. See, you everybody are, does. You are the perfect example. We uh, we had a podcast here a while back with uh, some with some heavy hitters. And uh, a guy named JF out of Canada was talking mm-hmm. about, about guys that build cars and then they just sit. So they want to do it just for the recognition or whatever. They, they don't, they don't, they're not hot rodders. They just do it because they want to be part of it, even though they don't know how to be part of it. Yeah. And, uh, and he had made the comment about, about being an ambassador. So you finish up with your, and you're an ambassador to our hobby. And you are a true ambassador to our hobby. Thank you. I mean, you, you live this. This is this, live uh, and breathe. and 24-7. This is, this is your world here. Yep. So It is 24-7. So what what is your next project you're going to build? You got you got your you got your wagon. You finally got, <laughs> got you finally got your wagon. The, the, the poor tea bucket that has 900 million miles on it. <laughs> well, the next thing I'm doing for me is a tea bucket. I've got a, uh, a 1959 era Vertex Magneto sitting in the living room, which you'll see here in a little bit. That actually has an advanced mechanism, so it was set up for the street. Okay. I've got to uh, I, I've actually got to take the the cover off the tea bucket to do this, but uh, going to drop the Vertex Magneto in it, get it set up with new plug wires, non-resistor plugs. Uh, I have to, there's a chrome oil pan that's right above our heads up here that has to go on it to replace the one that was cracked on a uh, speed bump leaving a park after a cruise four years ago. It's been dripping a quart <sighs> every couple of months. And get that back on the road. That's the next thing. All right. Judy's little falcon is outside here on jack stands. That's got to get back on the road in the next week or two. But once I've got those two back up and going again, I, I got to put air conditioning in the uh, in the wagon you sometime in the next week or so. Uh, but after after that is done, uh, my little roadster pickup that's out front here, I I owe it to that thing to get it up and and rolling. It's been together in that state for about fifteen years now, waiting for me to take the time to get it done. And it's just too cool not to to get it done. So it's going to get blown apart and primered and uh, wired. And hopefully the 283 that's been sitting there for 15 years is still good. And we'll just drive the hell out of that, too. There you go. So that's that's the immediate plan. Let's see, this is this is all part of that thing. It's like, yeah, you, you could have AC. And you've got the newer car when the weather is just brutal. And you, you can at least run around in that. But, but then you're driving. You shouldn't tell me see, things but, like that. But see, when you're doing that, you're you're not happy. Then I have you're, excuses. You're, you're, out of your, but see, you're out of your happy spot. You're going, this car has no soul. I want to be back in, in, in one of my cars. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Along the Wagon has soul. That's no. the cool part. When, when, when we first met, we kind of met, it was kind of funny. Uh, what do you call it? I don't even know what you call it. Social media. It was, it yeah. was, it was a forum. It was, it was just called it a forum. Right. And uh, I was building my truck. I, I had it on the ham and I had it on the, on the Chevy truck site. And you were following me on the ham. Yep. And you made stalking. Some, and you're kind of stalking, but, but you, you made some comments like, okay, obviously I'm doing this like you would like to do things. I was, we were kind of, we were kind of in the same, in the same brain pattern there. And, uh, and you had a, an older Plymouth you were driving. Mm-hmm. Full oh, on, yeah. full on hot rod. I mean, the thing was, was a tire blazing screamer. Silly. And, uh, and sadly it's sitting outside. So yes, explain why, why the Plymouth is, is no longer. Well, the, the, uh, yeah, the Plymouth got hit hard in like December of 11. But what's, and, and it, it necessitated building another chassis for the car, basically. It got hit that hard. Uh, when we threw it up on the rack over at Steve Szymanski's place, the uh, right front frame rail was almost two inches high, and the whole front end of the car was an inch and a half over to the, to the, uh, to the left-hand side. So it got nailed. But <laughs> what's ironic about that is that by that point, the car had 250,000 miles on it as a hot rod, and I'd driven it all 48 states, all the way across Canada, all the way across Mexico, and Canada a couple more times just for... See, ambassador. I'm going to go back yeah. to the ambassador. Back, back, this. And, back and forth to Cleveland, Ohio, when I, when I worked in Cleveland, Ohio, but lived in Phoenix. The uh, I, I went up to sign, I always say, sign the articles with my uh, with the corporation I went to work for, and the uh, CEO is shaking my hand and welcoming me aboard, and he reaches into his desk drawer and he pulls out keys to a then new Pontiac. This is about 90, 97 or 98 and hands them to me. And I went, I, I don't drive late model cars. Can I get a stipend on my car? And he says, I've seen your car. Does that actually go places? I'm like, it'll go anywhere you want it to. And so I spent five years using it genuinely as a businessman's coupe. 
and I never picked up the uh, the shiny new Pontiac G5 or whatever the hell it was at Doug Beck Pontiac. Well, it made it fun driving the hot run on somebody else's dime. Yeah, oh yeah. You yeah. can make the motor nasty, so it doesn't matter, they're paying for the fuel exactly, anyway. Exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. What, it only gets 21 miles to the gallon? Yeah, barely! But, uh, no, so it went back and forth to Cleveland and it went all over the country and uh, spent like 2001 in, in on the East Coast at a friend's place in Hartford, Connecticut. I'd just jump in it and go wherever I had to go for business. And, that way, if there was a hot rod event uh, in Rhinebeck, New York or something, I just went to that on the weekend and it was fun. Driving, so, the, driving the plane. It needs, to, it needs to come back and it needs to get back together. And it's, it's been another project because it's, it's, I ran out of money in the situation after the hit when we pulled it together or, or started pulling it back together. And uh, then business got so busy that money wasn't the object, time was. It's, it's everybody needs their stuff done and my stuff comes dead last. Sure, that's just so, part of having a business, that's just the way Which that is why we works. just pushed the Triumph motorcycle out of here to be able to do this. So I don't get to touch my stuff. That's cool. I'm a selfless person. Give, give, give. give <laughs> Always give. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about, yes, young Chip Quinn. Um, Obviously, you grew up around cars. We're talking about you know sleeping in in, uh, in in race cars and you know just and messing around with them. That's just being part of your life. I know a lot of a lot of car builders, a lot of a lot of hot rod guys that you know BMX was part of their life. What was was that your thing, or were you were you a skateboard guy? I mean, what was what was your what was your go to? BMX first, and then I found out I was a heck of a lot better at building bikes for everybody else than I was actually riding BMX. Uh, being the asthmatic kid, you just don't. You don't go out and compete with everybody else, but I had a ball of riding. Uh, I just couldn't, didn't have the endurance to, to ride. So I started building BMX bikes for everybody else when I was about 11 or 12. And that was right as the lightweight BMX bikes were coming in. So right. I was, that was a, the idiot st sitting here with my little drill press in my parents' garage, drilling out handbrake levers and all sorts of goofy crap like that. Uh, but then, yeah, skateboarding. Uh, about 1977, skateboarding became all consuming. And uh, I skated for a couple teams here locally in Phoenix. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I skated for Sidewalk Surfer. Uh, I skated uh, for a uh, park here in town that was called High Roller, which was one of the top parks in the nation at the time. Uh, messed myself up really badly when I was supposed to be in a contest the next day that was kind of going to determine if I had a future maybe as a pro skater or not. Uh, was screwing around with friends doing aerials out of a bowl at High Roller and, and fell backwards 13 feet into the bowl and broke my back the first time. The first time? <laughs> well, that was three times, but that's, that's a whole other story, uh, which is why I'm kind of gimpy sometimes. Okay, but this, is, this is funny. It seems like car guys are, are uh, for the most part, they're kind of adrenaline junkies. It, well, I don't yeah. even know what you want to call that because, I mean, me, I raced, I raced. I raced BMX and I did a little, little skateboarding. It wasn't huge in my in my world, but but the bikes that was that was definitely my thing. So so uh, no, it just that's funny how that seems to cross over. It's yeah, a, little, a little bit of the adrenaline thing, whether you whether you want to do it or not. It's yeah, just, absolutely. It's the reason why women have to have some sort of control over us most of the time, because yeah. otherwise things would be very different. No, you can't go do that. Get over here. You're gonna get hurt. <sighs> <laughs> Yeah. It starts with mom, and it just and just goes to the next step there. Yeah. Huh? It's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> Were your parents into this? I mean, who did you who did you follow? Somebody had to inspire you to go this direction. Absolutely. Somebody, my, somebody had to ruin you. <laughs> my, yeah. Well, I, I was born into a family that owned a speed shop. Okay. And my mom was just as nuts as he was as far as that stuff goes. So life for me for the first 10 years of my life was... Uh, it, it had a drag, it, it one of three different drag strips in the, the St. Paul, Minneapolis area on the weekends because we had salt, small satellite stores in each of them. Uh, by about 9, 10, I was riding a mini bike around in the pits, delivering people's parts to them out of our satellite stores. Uh, you want to go way far back, there's somewhere in a trade magazine from 65, there's a picture of my mom <laughs> uh, bottle feeding me sitting on a stack of tires at a drag strip somewhere. So it's it's always been like that. So you were cursed from an early age. Whether oh, you I had liked no it choice. Not. Yeah. I had no choice, and I, I I was that little that little bastard that actually could tell like a forty wheelies from a forty Ford coupe when I was three. Just 
That's a Willie's. Okay, great kid. I like spooky wheels, not fish wheels. <laughs> this is good. This is good. This is, you know, it was kind of wondering, you know, who ruined you? Somebody, <laughs> there's always somebody who influenced the direction you went. Yeah. And that happened to be your parents. Yeah, this and, is, and this mom is especially. no choice. And mom especially. And your mom is a crack up. I, 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 I've met your mom. <laughs> this, this is no choice. Yeah, she looks, she looks like the cuddly grandmotherly type. But she's, uh, she was quite a lot of fun. I actually remember being, I wasn't in a car seat, so I was probably five or six, and watching my mom talk her way out of a 120 mile an hour speeding ticket in her XKE. She did? <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. she had the gift. Exactly. So what did they have for cars? I mean, what did you grow up around? For the summertime, my, since, since our, our family business, a big part of our family business was tea buckets. My dad had a green metal flake bucket that was on a polished aluminum frame powered by a polished aluminum Buick 215 and a Jag rear end and all that cool stuff. Wow. And then car. my mom's was a little plainer. It was on one of our steel frames, but it was a uh, purpley pink metal flake and small block Chevy powered and, and all that. And that's, yeah, that's what I'd get picked up in in school in the summertime. If the, you know, if there wasn't 14 feet of snow in Minnesota right. like it normally is. So you were the cool kid then. Yeah, oh yeah. And then, then mom's other driver was uh, a 1963 XKE coupe that they took down to uh, Florida when they first got it. My dad was a dealer for Latham Superchargers. And they went to Daytona one year. And when they were in Daytona, uh, Latham was just right down the street in, in uh, I can't remember what town it was, I think it was Cocoa Beach. but. Uh, Mr. Latham approached him about borrowing the Jag to prototype a Latham supercharger kit, and it would be theirs for free. So the thing ran around with three Carter YFs hanging off of it, and the supercharger hanging off the right-hand side of it, making all sorts of wicked evil noises, and a psychotic four foot eleven lady driving it. Thing. So it was a fast. It was a fast Jag. Yeah, it was a very fast that. Jag. <laughs> and actually, my my dad got it for my mom as a wedding present with, in his mind, the full knowledge that there was no way in hell his cute little bride was going to drive this car, so he'd have another toy car for himself. Sure. It did not look that, that way in any shape or form at all. At all. So how old were you when you uh, when you finally put together your first car? If you grew up around tea buckets, see, that's actually funny because it's a hot rod, and you can build them relatively inexpensive. Yes. It's, it's not an expensive car. I mean, now it is. Yep. I mean, you know, especially if you want to build, you know, put nice parts in it, but... Which is why I've built a lot of the things, though, because it's always affordable to build. Yeah. yeah. 12, 12 is the official on that one. Uh, I found a 1935 Ford five-window coupe on the Pima Indian Reservation about four or five miles from downtown Scottsdale. And uh, had just taken a paper out and had the $650 that they wanted for the thing, and that was 1977. Dragged it home and got to work on it. And, uh, yeah. We got that one running and, and kind of running around with all... I, I've had a great crew of mentors, too. You ask me who screwed me up. Right. And I've always managed to be in the middle of a batch of mentors. Ronnie Olmstead, uh, God, Dick Smith, I'm sorry, I screwed that one up. And Fred Adrian, and, and a lot of guys came to, came to my aid when I was a kid. And had a bunch of stuff sitting in their backyards that was no longer in fashion. They took it out of their cars to put the modern stuff in. And they went, well, you want a 265 Chevy and an adapter? In and it went. So I built, right now, the 35 that I built when I was a kid would have been so in step with all the traditional cars, but back then it was like, God, don't park that with us, please. It's, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> but it was, it was cool. And then uh, I, uh, I moved up to Minnesota when I was 15 and had to have something that was a little bit more roadworthy, so... I sold that and I found a 39 Ford Deluxe Coupe that had a 283 and a four-speed in it in Scottsdale sitting in a uh, sitting in a, a carport and bought that. And that's what took me to Minnesota. So, so yeah, you were ruined from a young age. Right? I, I was dumb. That was, I was, I was in the crib pushing cars around going brrrr, stuff like that. Came home from the hospital in a Model A Coupe because that was the only thing that would get through the snow at that time. Uh, we're sitting here, we're sitting here talking and, and I, I've been out of the shop a few times and uh, it's so cool because you, you live in an older part of town. Yeah. And, uh, and you paid your house off. Is this good? House, house is your house. I'm a homeowner. 
the uh, the shop is probably as old as the house. Yeah, 19, 1912. That's how old the shop yeah. is? So it was it was so, a uh, Yes, it sounds as old as it is. It was actually a carriage house and a barn. This is where the horse lived, and that's where the carriage lived. But I, I told Brian we were walking around taking photos. I said, what's so cool? I said, this is probably 80% of how car guys are. It's like you have to make make do with the room you have. So yeah, yeah stuff gets hung up, and it's like, well, I can't throw this away because I may need this. Even though the women are going, you don't need it. I may need this. <laughs> I need this. I'm not dead yet. I may need this sometime <laughs> in my life. Yeah, the, uh, the floor in this place was poured long after this was a... Uh, a carriage house and barn. Yeah, and back in the 90s, I used to uh, to pair up Halibrand wheels and sell them. I had a Rolodex full of people that had stray Halibrand wheels. So if I'm walking through a swap meet and I find a 15 by 6, 2 inch backspace sprint that's a single, so it's $125 that I can afford it, Right. I'd buy it and I'd go home and hit my Rolodex pre computer and call somebody up in Washington and go, hey, have you got a single two-inch backspace sprint, six-inch wide? Yeah. What do you want for it? Take 100 bucks. Cool. So now you got a pair. So now i got a pair. And I'd, I'd polish them to match, or I'd do whatever to match, sitting right here at the bench. And I was out here. The reason I mentioned that with the floors is if you look at the floors, the floors in this place look like they were floated with a giant stiff push broom. And so I'm out here one night, and it's like 40 degrees. It's the middle of winter. And I have a guy coming over to pick up a pair of, of Halibrands the next morning. One had been fully polished. The other one was still in the really rough sand pits. Okay. So I'm sitting here with a die grinder. And they're magnesium, of course. And, and you have, now you have, you have dust, magnesium dust all over the floor. Okay. And every, every now and then, every now and then, I'm looking down and seeing this big pile of magnesium dust on the floor. And I'm sweeping it all up. And I'd been burning a bunch of racing alcohol that was left over in a hubcap right in the middle of the room trying to get some heat in the room. Every now and then I'd replenish it and drop a match in it and you know, right. and so we're, <laughs> we're polishing magnesium. Sure. Yeah. This is a real I'm ocean gonna safety dance. thing. I'm going to dance with death. If I only had some water to put out the <laughs> magnesium fire it would be <laughs> So, <laughs> So I, I start sweeping all these up and it's like oh it's a little pile look drop a match on it. Shh, bright light and it's gone right? right? Oh that was really cool. Work another hour. Another little pile. <laughs> Go back to working. You got to do the lurch. The lurch. <laughs> kind of and so I, I get busy and I get distracted and I run out of alcohol to burn. It's cold as hell. I want to get this damn thing done. And so I put in like two and a half hours grinding and sanding and doing all this stuff. And I look down and everything is mag gray down on the floor. And I start sweeping it up. And I swept it right to, you know, right there. Okay. And it's this pile like this. And I'm like, well, do I dare drop a match on that? That's a lot of magnesium. It might actually burn down. for a little while and create some issues. And it's like, how the hell with it? <laughs> and this thing, I mean, it, it burns up to the point where it's about three feet tall for about 30 seconds. But what was really, really, really disconcerting was all of the magnesium had settled into all the brush striations in the floor. And so it sent these spider fires every different direction, under the bench, under the car oh, that's sitting here, wow. under that bench, under <laughs> under the wall over here. <laughs> Not panic sitting. <laughs> I'm running around like an idiot. <laughs> Trying to put out all these idiotic fires. I did get that set done and sold and all that stuff, and life was much better the next day. I think I paid the mortgage or something, but yeah. That's good. So that was a dumb story with magnesium wheels. I'm, I'm laughing because you know there's going to be guys in Michigan going, you're complaining that it was 40. <laughs> Dude, we're just now putting a sweatshirt on. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, no, it is. It's, I can see the thermometer. It's 102 in here. I'm in jeans and a T-shirt. It's 102 in, in here. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a bit toasty. It's uh, I do well in 100, 110. I just don't do well. I don't in, like 40 in, either. I am, I am. It's too cold for me. 50, I'm, a, I'm a baby. 50, I start to whine and cry, and it's really sad. You, you are a lot like I am. Everything is old-fashioned stuff. I'm a, you know, Holly Carburetor. What you're, you're just, you're messing with old stuff. The newer thing is cool, but kind of scary at the same time. And last time I was here, you were putting a fuel injection. You, you changed that Holly Carburetor and put a fuel injection on it on a truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember laughing, going, "Do you have any idea of what you're doing?" And you're like, "No, I, th I think I have it figured out." <laughs> Well, you're and you're still alive, see, so nothing blew up. <laughs>
<laughs> so, yeah. so how how is that going? Are are you are you learning the the old dog new tricks thing? I've done three or four fuel injections since that, and and I'm I'm actually pretty comfortable with them. But uh, yeah, it, it it works out pretty well. <laughs> One thing I'm looking at it's funny because I don't know you as a motorcycle guy. I, I know you more as a mini of a, of a mini bike guy. Yeah. There's another one of your one another one oh of your God. cheerleading moments yes. was your was your mini bikes. You have a lot of motorcycles around here that you don't ride. So is it? <laughs> but they're cool. They're cool old bikes. You know, there's nothing late model in here. This is really old tech stuff. Um, is it? Is it more for the art form? You just want to look at motorcycles to say you have one and you like working on them? Or I mean, what's what? Well, I, there, there are certain things that I go completely daffy for, as, as you've probably figured out at this point. And uh, the, the whole daffiness on this whole thing, my, my buddy Ron Olmsted had loaned me his uh, 57 Triumph to ride around for a couple of weeks 20 years ago. And it was a ball. It was a lot of fun. And a 57 Triumph T110 is a neat looking bike. And uh, so I decided I needed a Triumph. And I went out and bought one and put it together. And uh, I never quite got it to the point where it was a rider, and, and I had some stuff come up, and I had to sell it and things. And, and uh, the, the Triumph that we just pushed out of here, the 53, a little while, a little while ago, that kind of came to me. I was buying parts for another bike I've got. I also went completely daffy on mid-60s and early-70s Hondas. And it was at a point in time when that sort of bike was getting more and more expensive, and I'd find them for like 25 bucks. Well, that needs to come home with me and goes into the pile for things to do in the near future. Well, so I showed up at, uh, at a motorcycle parts shop here in town, and uh, Rod, the guy that owns the place, said, you're a Triumph kind of guy, aren't you? I said, yeah. He says, I, sold you, I know I sold you a bunch of Triumph stuff last year for, the, for a bike you were working on. He says, I've got something you're going to need. I went, what is it? And my 53 is what you call a pre-unit Triumph. And if... To this day, if you're out buying Triumph motorcycle parts and you say pre-unit instead of unit, it's like saying, I have a 32 Ford 3 window and I need to buy parts. Everything is a lot more expensive. Okay. And so Rod walks me out into a section of his wrecking yard and goes, this just came in the other day. I think it's a 53 or 54. You want it? I went, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm broke. He goes, give me 125 bucks for it. I went, I have that. I'll give you $125 <laughs> for it. I don't know what I'm going to tell the mortgage company in a couple of days, but we'll figure that out when we come to it. So I dragged it home. And my biggest coup in this world is the fact that when Judy moved into the house, that was on the, the, uh, the coffee table in my uh, family room for three years after she moved in, which I thought was cool. But, yeah, it's kind of an object art thing. I, I love them. I love riding them a little bit here and there, but I'm kind of a – Kind of a chicken foot with that stuff anyway. Okay, but now now we'll go to the mini bikes. Yeah. This is your world. Yeah. You, another one of my worlds. You like the mini bikes. There's another one of your, your cheerleading thing. I yeah. I know that that over the years you would put together in the in the fall and and uh, you know, late late winter I guess we'll we'll say, because it was it wasn't quite spring yet. It was it was still nice weather outside and you'd yeah. put together and and uh, a bunch of you would meet and go ride and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, because they're illegal to ride on the street. Absolutely. You know, they, they have, you know, no lights and turn signals and headlights. And, you know, Absolutely. The... <laughs> Turns out if you get enough of them together with a bunch of middle-aged guys on yeah. them, nobody cares. Nobody knows what to do. It's like, yeah, or out. <laughs> <laughs> and what are they... <laughs> they look at you and what, go, oh, okay, they're is, fine. Let yeah, they look at you, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I got to go. The best comment on that was at one of, our, one of our meets that we had. Every time I put on a big thing, either at a friend's house or at an off-site place, every, every one of them, the cops would roll up and want to know what we were up to. And since I was always the guy in charge, if that's not scary enough, uh, I'd go out and <laughs> deal with the cops. And so I go, I, you know, everybody, all of my adult friends, I'm, I'm across the street where we've got everything based, we're having, having our little ride in this parking lot across the street, cops roll up, all of my adult friends, like 12-year-old boys, peg the throttle and run across the street on their mini bikes to get away from the cop. Sure. Ah! And I go walking across, and I walk up to his window, and I tapped on his window, and I said, Howdy, what are you up to? He goes, are you boys practicing for, like, the circus or something? 
<laughs> yes, sir. That's yes, all sir. Doing. All the rest of the monkeys are right across the street <laughs> over there. We're getting pretty good. Said, yeah, I noticed they're kind of scattered. Yep. Yeah, say so they're going to laugh. Well, what, they're not going to take, like, what, what, even a cop, you know, even, he's not going to take you serious. It's going to go, I got to go. You guys are morons. A friend, friend of mine noted, two friends of mine were talking about those those get togethers on Facebook the other day, and uh, my buddy Nikki Flores said, Yep, get together so good even the cops couldn't mess it up. How many? What's what's the most you've had at one of your at one of your get-togethers? Best one I ever did was the uh, the Arizona mini bike vintage mini bike roundup. I think it was 2015 or 2016. We had 95 bikes, <laughs> swap spaces, people running around. We we held it in an industrial park, and we had a drag strip. We had a road course. We had. There's a there's a YouTube video out on it somewhere out there that, that a friend of mine awesome. shot. That was it's just insanity. It's mini bikes going all over the place. It looked that like is, figure eight racing or something. That is awesome. So it was cool. It was cool. I'd like to do more of that <laughs> stuff. I just haven't had time to in a long time now. But see, they're cool. They're just cool. That's like well, just like that brings up a little kid in every. I don't care how old you are. You become a little kid as soon as you get on a mini bike. You know, and, and laughing at myself on, on one of the first ones I built about 10, 12 years ago riding up central in front of all these mirror glass buildings. You, know, you get on you get on a motorcycle or you get on a mini bike and you're like, I'm the coolest guy on the planet right now. Rum, rum, rum. Yep. And you, you ride up the sidewalk in front of a mirrored building and you see this this fifty year old form on this bike this bike that's Hanging made for a yeah. child. Like, <laughs> I am the biggest dork that has ever walked the face of this planet. And right see, here and now. But see and kids laugh at you, women go What's wrong with that guy? But then there's every other middle-aged guy going, man, I want a mini bike. Yeah, so, exactly. Oh. I did get one when I was a kid. Oh. So you're not really a big dork. You're, you're the guy that, that makes the other guys envious. I oh, mean, I want to be riding on a mini bike right now. I would be so cool, too. Yeah, We'd would be, be cool so together. Cool. <laughs> Why are you going to pack? <laughs> Joe, you're just a pack of dorks on little bikes. <laughs> We got Ed Grimma in town now, who is uh, the terror from the east with that stuff. I guess he put on a lot of events and things, and he and I keep tell- talking about doing something. We just neither it's of us. It's have a bunch time. of us one from California when I come over, and it's like I want to be part of this. This is. Did you, you got you put together one? Or you I, have I got some pieces. I have some pieces and parts for one. I get to be one of those stupid guys. Yes. <laughs> Pete, Pete Eastwood keeps telling <laughs> my mini bike's running. Are you gonna do something? Uh, uh, see, you got I'm trying. Is, so if you ever if you ever get involved in putting another thing, uh, you know, another another I event know, on, there's going to be a whole bunch of us be free lodging. Yeah, we got a, we piling got floor out space. of here. Bring the out do the, do the mini bike event. Yeah, I did you you know me. But see, you think tell, about you think I can about, tell stories all day, but, but see, half of them are fun, half of them are stupid. But see, so. like that, you th- those people like stories. Yeah, this is what makes what we do so fun <laughs> because they want to hear they want to hear guys want to hear stupidity. That's what we live for. Especially stuff we're jealous of. I want to be that stupid. <laughs> I never get to be stupid. <laughs> right? Yeah. I've pretty much made a career of being stupid. Same. Even even when I was like a legitimate adult with a real job, I was still oh, doing the stupid throw, crap that nobody else wanted to do. There, I mean, there's all sorts of stories. There's all sorts of stuff. But it's the, the whole world is just hot rods and things. And... and all of the ancillary stuff that goes with it. Your whole world is hot rods. Yep. That, that is your world. And it's it's been a damn good world now for 55 years, so I'm pleased. I don't think I'm going to change it anytime real soon. No, I don't think you're ever going to grow up. If you did, I would be really disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just utterly failed at being grown up. I was so <laughs> grown up. I was so grown up in, in 1987 through about 19... 19- 98 when I was running the family's businesses and stuff that I was actually kind of boring. Well, I wasn't boring because I was racing VWs on the weekends and crap like that, but I was still just like, I, I was running a crew of 50 people that were all in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and I was in my 20s. Right. So I had to be the very upstanding young man in the suit and tie and all this stuff all the time. And I, I looked at myself in the mirror one day, and it's like, ah, no. I, the cars were omnipresent. I mean, my, my parking spot in front of my sewing machine shop was right on Thomas Road, and the, the 48 Plymouth was sitting there. The the 63 Bug that ran mid-11s was sitting there. And, you know, nice. you know, it was it was always something in my space at the shop that was not normal in any way, shape, or form. The, uh, the Plymouth actually came home because a, a former girlfriend 
was so sick and tired of the hot rods and mini trucks and VWs and stuff like that, she informed me that I had to go buy a car. Now in her mind, she's thinking I needed to go buy a Mercedes or something that befitted my station in life and all this crap. Right. So my first, my first thing that I did that day was I took a, uh, a sewing machine cabinet out to a gal that lived on a ranch in Buckeye on the Gila River and set it all up, set her machine up for her, and she'd spent all this money with me, and so I, I wanted to handle it personally and all that. And I look out the back window, and there was a 48 Plymouth rolled on its roof, right back on the bank of the of the Gila River. Okay. It didn't have any front sheet metal on it, but I could tell what it was from the, the firewall and all that crap, and I said, hey, what's, uh, what's up with that old car back there? And she says, what car? I said, well, no, there, there's an old car. I can see it through the back window there, and you know, I'm working on the cabinet over here and all this. And, and she said, oh, you'd have to ask my husband. And so I finished up and I walked out there and I said, sir, what's going on with that, that 46, 7, 8 Plymouth? He says, that's not really a car anymore. I said, well, no, it's 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 a four, like a 46, 7, 8 Plymouth. He says, no, that's about to get pushed down the bank for erosion control when it floods. And I said, no, what do you want for it? He says, well, I'd, if, if you can find somebody to tow it out of here, I'll give it to you. And so I called a friend of mine with a towing company. Dude, you got to come out here and get this thing for me. I don't care what it costs. And so he came out. We rolled it over and towed it. And I had him drop it right under the pergola in the front driveway of the thing. So right. when she came home from school, she had a major flip out. She told me to go buy a car. I did that. She was gone a week later. Was, she didn't tell you what was, kind of car to buy. She didn't tell me what kind of car to buy. Specifics. And it was heaven because she was gone. It was That was all that it took. It was a, awesome. a Plymouth coming home. The story of the Plymouth. The story of the Plymouth. That went all over the United States. That went all over See? the United States. So it could have been erosion control or it could have been... It could have been something. Transportation. Hey, you know, when anybody ever bugs me about driving hot rods around, I'm always, hey, it's, it's recycled. It's exactly, it, it was junk oh, it's, before. It's, it's definitely paid for itself it's a long time itself. ago in everything, in the whole spectrum. Yep. So, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, Mr. Quinn, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I, I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I, I love the environment right here because it's, it's so me. It's, it's clutter. You, you keep everything. Oh, you and I are so much. <laughs> it's, it's organized chaos. You know where everything's at. Somebody can walk in and go, I want to get out. You go, well, what are you looking for? I got, say. Everything you, except these, you, which I had to go to Speedway last week and but buy. See, you, you know where everything's at. You, you, but you I found was, them today while we were looking at stuff to, to shoot funny. on the ceiling. You, you found the extra set that you lost. I found you, the set that, that I had yeah. spooled for this modified for Perfect. five years. But uh, yeah. thank you for, uh, for, for telling, telling a little bit about yourself and, thank and, you. your, and your story. It was, it thank was, you for being here. It was been fun. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't just fall off into us laughing so hard that we couldn't uh, breathe. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
So how many Green Day song titles can I fit in here before Chip catches on? The first sign that something was wrong was when I looked at the thermometer in the garage and it registered in Kelvin. On this episode of Stories in Steel, the gang heads to Chip's Phoenix. Uh, Chip's Phoenix, like the guy owns the town. One man, so many taco stands. I want to be your louver. Wasn't that a Prince song? Oh wait, that was the Canadian release. To steal a joke from Johnny Carson, it was so hot that day I took a dollar out of my pocket and George Washington had his wig off. Is louver a word? Come on, man, just, just read the copy. I refuse to read this. The whole experience is kind of disappointing. I mean, you watch this shit on TV and there's all kinds of sparks flying everywhere. I'm telling you, we should do the photo shoot in front of a Walgreens. It worked really well for that one show on Amazon. Once again, I'd like to extend a special hello to the person typing in the closed captions. On this episode of Steely's and... Uh, on this story's an episode... Oh, for crying out loud. A real hero would put the coconut in the lime. Well, we've each had a burrito and a rock star. This should be a fun ride home. No, no, no. By all means, you should take that. It's a lot like hell, but just slightly less humid. I'm looking over your copy and it says, uh, Chip was in the Louvre? Yeah, just because the R is silent doesn't mean you don't put it down on paper. In this episode of Stories in Steel, the gang stops by to visit Chip Quinn at home in Steve. <sighs> Speaking of Chip, you know, if there's a Chip Quinn, is there an unbroken Quinn? A whole Quinn? On this episode of Stories in Steel, Brad sits down with Phoenix Quinn. <laughs> Phoenix, oh my God, Phoenix Quinn. Yeah, the Phoenix Quins, they're old money. <laughs> the Phoenix Bryans, they're no money. Stories and Steel, Chip Quinn intro take. Uh, I, I don't. Not many people understand the whole louver within a louver thing. For more stories and podcasts, go to www.round6pod.com.